Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Marin Jax. I'm working at the Austrian Mediathek. Um, for those of you who know me, um, I've been working for 10 years uh, in video digitization and recently shifted uh, to work uh, in digital archiving. So that's why I'm talking about files and folders um, with you. Okay, I can, yes, I can switch. So what is the Austrian Mediathek? Just real quick, we were founded in the year 1960 as an audio archive. And since the year 2001, we are a branch of the Vienna Technical Museum. Um, and we became uh, the National Austrian uh, Audio and Video Archive. Our audio digitization started in the year 2000. And the video digitization, since some of you may remember in the year 2011. And with that, we were one of the first users of FF1, which was very controversial at the time. Um, over the time, um, our digital archive grew to about 300,000 um, digital items. By digital items, I actually mean uh, a bundle of, um, uh, sorry bundle of files and folders that are connected to an archival item. So it um, so there are more manifestations to it. Um, digital files overall, we have about 5 million in our archive. So when I look at our digital collection, um, I think there's three main questions to be asked. Um, is every digital object in our collection complete? Is it consistent with our rules and our structure? And is it functional? Um, another way of looking at our archive based on those uh, questions is thinking of it um, in form of a, what I called a preservation pyramid. At the very basis, there's the storage infrastructure. Without that, you can't even start. So this is the fundament where you have to build up upon. The next step I would see uh, is the transfer of the files to make sure that the transfer is accurate to your digital archive. And when the files are there, you have to check the integrity so that um, to protect it against um, unauthorized modifications. On top of that, I would see consistency. By consistency, I mean the functionality of your files and folders in the context of your infrastructure. And this often comes down to file naming and file paths and, if, and the question if they are consistent. Um, it's also the question of is everything stored where it should be? And is, it can also be extended to your databases and are the items uh, represented in your databases correct? Um, on top of that, I would see file functionality. Um, I also like to use this way of looking at our archive um, in a form to uh, assess the risks that are um, associated with those, those steps. So for example, storage infrastructure, if that's not working, everything is affected. Um, transfer integrity checks, it's most of your archive consistency could be if could be more and file functionality. It depends how many uh, files are affected. So what I wanted to talk to you about is um, the topic of consistency and integrity, and also the way that the Mediathek um, found a way to deal with that and um, how we check that. Um, I want to say that I think dealing with inconsistency actually is part of the process of archiving. Since things simply, simply uh, change over time, and this also implies to strategies and to conventions in file naming and file paths. Um, so I think it's important to think that um, inconsistency are not always uh, an error in itself but can be an expression of change and development. And I also like 
to think about it that it could be also seen as an expression of the history of your digital archive. Um, I think consistency is important. And what I also find is that it often is something that lacks attention. It is often something that is not often talked about uh, and it's not often the topic about conferences. And even though that this topic is underrepresented, um, from my conversations with archives, I find that many archives struggle with that. And that this problem often is not addressed because of other priorities. And you often don't know actually where to start. So why is it important? I think um, consistency in your file name and file path is the basis for data access. Um, it's also the basis for error detection because um, if you deal with a lot of inconsistent data, you simply don't know where to find uh, the errors or it's like looking for um, the needle in the haystack. It's a basis for automatization and it's also a basis for change. So what may change over time? Um, so there could be the naming conventions of files and folders, the use of lowercase, uppercase, uh, separated. It could also apply to rules in digitizing. Do you um, do file segmentation? Um, do you append tracks, for example? It could also apply to copies. What copies do you produce of your archival items? Like preview copies, web copies, um, do you have originals? And also cataloging convention my change over time. So the big question is when it comes to consistency, where to start? And I think there's two main questions. What kind of exist inconsistency exists in your digital archive? And what items are affected by a certain case of inconsistency? Um, as you might remember, we, we have 5 million files in our digital archive. So this is not something that book we could uh, manage manually. So we had to come up with a solution uh, where a machine, a software helps us. And the result of this is uh, Medias. Medias is the latest archiving project at the Austrian Mediathek and is our tool for regular integrity and consistency checks. So what is it? It is an archival monitoring system that is based on a search engine it indexes the data in our digital archive according to the properties that we specified. It also performs in integrity checks and it simply monitors our digital archive. So from a technical point of view, what is it? It is an adaption of search IT, which is a product that is based on the Elastic Stack, Elastic Search, Kipana, uh, and it uses Apache Manifold for process management. So it is um, a solution that is based on open source, but uh, it is not open itself. In starting this process, we mended it to have a copy of the source code, and we are also allowed to make future adaptions independently. This year's motto is open is not enough. And as you might imagine, I asked myself, is my talk open enough? Is it actually okay to talk to you or at no time to wait about a project which is based on open source, but not open itself? Um, so I'm aware that this is controversial and I even thought about withdrawing, um, but I kept going because, and there I use this cite, uh, citation that no time to wait in a part is about bringing openness into our work um, and I think that that can also mean uh, talking openly about our work. And in that case, it could be mean more to, oh, um, yeah, to be simply more than open. For me, and this is, that is um, meant personally, no time to wait. Uh, I've always experienced as a safe space 
where smaller and especially non-broadcast archives gather to talk openly about their struggles and solutions to fulfill the digital archival tasks. It is a space where archives meet that have similar use case and resources than what I experience in my work. And I also thought that openness can be about sharing ideas and concepts, even if I'm not able to share the software with you. What also motivated me to give this talk is that I wanted to break a lens that clear rules according to file paths and file naming conventions are highly important and often neglected. And I wanted to show you in our example medias what is possible if you can translate your file paths and your name to data and to make the data accessible. I thought, um, and I hope so that this concept may be interesting to others and is worth sharing. So what is Medias? It is not an asset management system. It is an expansion, expansion and customization of a search engine. It is a control instance that controls our digital archive. And what I think is important uh, is that our digital archive is fully functional without it. And I actually see it um, as this is one of, uh, this is an important feature. Our catalog is external and all file operations are external. So what does it do? It searches our digital archive and our web storage. It indexes the data according to properties. So it can identify our archival master, digital originals, preview copies, web copies, prefixes, that we used in our file naming conventions and suffixes. Uh, it can identify editing copies and um, also groups like images, metadata, master files. So how did we ad identify uh, those manifestations? By the use of our file structure. File paths can offer, in our case, offers uh, important information about the files and the manifestations that it contains. Um, the second one was naming. Um, so the, yeah, I will show an example of that. Um, our naming conventions um, look like that. So the first number is uh, a, a digitized VEX cylinder. I can see that by the prefix number one who identifies the original format, then we have a consecutive number. And at the end, we have a suffix, which tells us that we are dealing with an edited copy. The second example shows us an audio cassette, which is identified by the prefix number six. It is followed by a consecutive number and a suffix, um, which tells us we're dealing with uh, the A side of this cassette. I was always talking, also talking uh, about file paths. So this is what our file paths actually look like. By the first file pass, I can identify the privy copy. The second one identifies the archive copy and the third one, our web copy. So when all this data is collected, um, we also search our databases and we ask the databases the questions, what items should exist on our digital archive, according to you. We're working with uh, several databases, an inventory-based data, a database, a catalog database, and an online database. And in the end, all the data that is collected is matched to our set of rules. Um, Medias also has some additional fe features. It documents every change of data per item and file. It regularly checks for uh, errors um, and makes MD5 checks. We manage deletion through it using a four eyes principle. And where, where I think it's the, the main power is, is that we, it enables us to perform a variety of queries over our digital archive based on the defined properties. So what I think is um, interesting about this concept, first of all, there was this, when we started it, we had the vision 
that we wanted to make our digital archive as easily accessible to everyone working at the Austrian Mediathek. So we wanted uh, to, to have as a result that everyone could see if the digital icons in our archive are correct and they're doing fine and the checksums is fine and so on. Um, another point that I find interesting is uh, the te technology break. So it's an external instance of control um, instead of um, some other approaches where we have this one digital asset management systems. So I think that's important to, um, I don't know, to diversify, to have checks. And the other point that I thought in, is important that we could use the advantages of using a search engine. Um, and the main advantage that I think is that in, it enables us to find the unexpected. So I wanted to go on now uh, and... And Mario, a small point of order. Uh, I yeah. have the, the good news that our, our fourth speaker of the afternoon has entered the Zoom meeting. So oh, okay. we have our fourth panel. And I would suggest if that's feasible to that you have five more minutes. for Yeah, five more minutes is fine. I'm nearly finished. So I just wanted to, to give you a quick view. Um, I hope you see it. So this is um, the result. I, I told you it's a modification of a, um, existing software. So this is our starting point. It's a search engine for documents used in companies. And um, this is what it looks like when um, you see our digital archive now. So you easily see all the items that we have in our archive and you could actually scroll through everything that exists in our archive now. Um, you can see in one uh, easily that we have an archive copy here. We also have a preview copy here. I can also switch to the files um, that belong to that signature. Look at the checksums, for example, we have three different spaces where we save the checksums. Um, and I was talking about, um, it was important for us that is our data is very accessible to the people working in our archive. Um, this is also done by data visualization. So um, this is a part of the Kibana part of the project. So you can see all the prefixes from everything that is in our archive. So you can easily identify um, the formats that have a digital representation in our digital archive. And this can easily give you some insights about our archive. So example, how many digital originals do we have in comparison to our analog files? Um, we are also... Um, and able to easily check if a checksum is not correct. So this is an example, it's a test file. So don't, don't worry. And we can um, see very easy which file is affected by that. Uh, another thing for data visualization is that we can visualize, um, take some time, um, every extension that exists in our archive. So every, extension within our 5 million files. And here I can easily find, for example, a swap file. This is what I mean by finding the unexpected. Uh, so we wouldn't expect to uh, have that file entered our archive, but the important part is to um, detect it and to be able to correct it. One thing I wanted to show you, because I think that is very useful, is um, I can search for files um, using MD5 checksum. Uh, and this is something that I wanted to show because I think um, some of you might experience that they find uh, an AV file somewhere in the office infrastructure and wonder, is this file a copy of something that is in our archive or does it belong in our archive? And using the checksum as identifier can be very helpful um, to identify duplicates. So before I'm finished,
I wanted to show you one last thing. And this is the timeline. Um, I started off talking about um, conventions uh, also as um, the, the digital data in the archive that it can be seen as historical data. And this is the timeline of our digitization and all the inputs um, of files into our digital archives over the time. And what I think is nice to see is that you would see here a drop down, a drop which ex actually was where the lockdown took place uh, in Vienna. So um, there is history uh, written in our digital archive data as well. So with that, I'm finishing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. I, I'm not sure. I think you were you were talking and focusing on the talk, but the the chat is blowing up with uh, enthusiasm for your chat uh, and, oh, and your demonstration. No, I was so, not looking at the chat. I was scared. Okay. <laughs> that is fine. I think everybody's really happy that you decided to come and give the talk and, and share your learnings. Um, while it's, it does seem that our last speaker has left the, the chat, so that means that we have some room to 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 talk about this a little bit more. I have some questions. Joanna has a question, but I also saw a question from Claudio. Claudio asked whether there are cases when you can't follow your own naming convention and then how you deal with that from the get-go. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are, of course. And there have been uh, findings in the past and the whole idea to um, the whole topic of consistency came up because our archive is old and that every time the convention uh, was clear. So we thought we would have, um, we would need means to find out and to find the unexpected. And we did a lot of cleaning up and correcting already, but uh, I think this is going to be an ongoing process. And I also think um, what also motivated me to talk about is because I, I think Often it is uh, connected with shame and a feeling of error, but it's all, I wanted to make the point that it is an expression of, of history and it's okay. You, you just should know about it or, and try to, um, yeah, correct it. You quote a, a famous uh, uh, actor from The Wire, it's all in the game, man. Um, <laughs> I think Joanna, so Joanna was asking about the checks and searches. She was very enthusiastic about your, your checks and searches and is wondering how frequently the whole archive is scanned. That means the, the, checks and, the checks and checking process. Yeah. And how quickly you can identify fixity errors if they if and when they appear. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we are actually, our plan was to check the whole archive uh, four times a year with checksum verification. So calculating them. Um, and it, at the moment, it takes us two weeks time to go through the whole archive. So we detected, actually, we, we could do it more often. And since we have it in use, uh, we, we triggered it often manually because we did some changes and we did some corrections. Uh, so we're much more often than four times a year at the moment. Thank you so much. I had a question myself, um, uh, and that is specifically, so you, Dave, Dave has given, given talks and written about um, AV archivists needing to adapt existing tools from the market to specific archival purposes. And that seems to be something you've done here, Elastic, Elastic Search Stack and a, a document processing company and just tuning it to your, to your own needs. So I have two questions is A, what was in your view lacking from the sort of archival management systems field that you chose you to go down this path? Uh, and secondly, how hard it was to make the translation from from your needs, like to to involve them in this process of thinking with you on on how to how to address these archival needs. Okay, um, well, I think uh, we started off with the vision of having it um, our archive as accessible as possible. So data visualization was a main part, and this is something that um, yeah we we found in, 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 at that solution. Um, the other thing was uh, what actually was new to me is that using a, a search engine who just simply, when I um, enter uh, the file overview, I see everything that is in our archive, um, but not in the structure. So the, you can leave the whole structure out and see every file. 
and then you can start you working yourself up and filtering through through the files and i think that's that's new and i haven't seen it um, in any other application so far that is used in archival context is and you had a second question, which I don't yeah, remember. Sorry, I should have, I should have uh, separated them out. Um, the second part was how how complex it was in, in the conversation with, with this particular vendor or maybe other vendors in the past. How 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 complex it was to translate your your wishes and needs, and how easily did they grasp the the sort of yeah, yeah the functionality that you were looking for. Yeah, I think that that was actually a, a good question, and it was a very interesting experience because. To me, uh, talking in our archival context is, is normal. And um, as every archive, we have our um, special, um, I don't know, namings for, for as, and convention even to talking about our archives. So translating that was a challenge, but it was actually great because uh, it forces you to think about um, your conventions and clarify them. This, this is a point of view and decide and say, okay, every item in our archive has to look that way and that way. And there's the exception. And what do we do with the exception now? Do we implement it uh, and make the exception um, uh, okay? Or do we change the exception? So uh, yeah, I think that that was very um, interesting and I, and for me, it was really interesting um, to, to really get clear about our rules in the archive and our conventions. Yep, wonderful. In the meantime, our next speaker has entered the room. I just wanted to close with one last question from Gilles, who asked when and how people can get their hands on this particular piece of software that you guys built together. Yeah, that was the point that I was making. Um, the problem is that it is based on open source, but we cannot publish this as open source because of the, public, uh, the, the policy of the vendor. So uh, this actually was what my concerns were about, about sharing this at no time to wait. And my point was, I do it anyway, because I think the concept might be of interest and might inspire others. Okay. But I would have loved to make it open. There's a bright future for us. Yeah, exactly. So keep, I think the, qu the question isn't necessarily can it be used openly, but is there going to be a licensing model or are they thinking of a licensing model? Is, is, oh, is what a was the question? Yeah, sorry. So is, is a vendor trying to like make it available as a product that people pay for? Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Wonderful. It and, actually is a product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you've inspired everyone. Um, Ashley, of course, mentioned that some of those features are available in other systems, and I think it is to their own which which system uh, is wonderful um, to their own needs. Um,